one of the reasons I'm happy to present him is that our ongoing and already very fruitful collaboration with him started um, almost accidentally, I think, at the very beginning of this year, when um, out of the blue he invited me to take part in a discussion he organized in Berlin uh, titled, Do We Need, what, what was it? So left wing, left wing, pop solidarischen populism. Okay, so do we need a solidary populism? Doesn't sound as as elegant in English. Um, and I was initially reluctant to accept the um, invitation because most of the other participants were from the art scene, and my experience until then of discussing politics and society with artsy people had been very disappointing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was extremely pleasantly surprised by the quality and sophistication of the discussion, but also by the presence of a number of people from that scene who I could sense were anything but the cliché postmodernist that one usually pictures when thinking about these people. Um, and I really liked the, the energy that was present um, in really trying to find out what can be done um, about populism. So I'm extremely happy that Alexander Koch is here. Um, I will remind you that the uh, exhibit that you can see on the walls in this building right now presents several snapshots from the project that he'll be talking about, the initiative that he'll be talking about, the new patrons. Um, so Alexander Koch is the co-founder and co-owner of the KOV Gallery in central Berlin, which is, um, to my mind, which is um, sort of bereft of any expertise in the, in the matter, but I think one of the most interesting and original um, galleries in, in Germany. Um, but in addition, he is the one who has brought this initiative um, called the New Patrons from France to Germany and who has uh, just raised an impressive amount of money from the German Cultural Foundation to institutionalize this initiative, create you know, an office um, with staff and sort of try to perpetuate it. And um, he's going to speak, I think, both of the original idea and of how it has played out in the German context and of his plans for the future. Thank you very much. So after this nice introduction, I don't feel like the cultural program uh, <laughs> at the end of the evening. Um, so it just came to my mind that I maybe should remind us that the history of the development of modern democracies is strongly connected to the development of modern art. Yeah. So being trained as a public into a peaceful conflict that is only about something that we see and that we can really not agree uh, on without killing each other was a very fundamental experience to create that public sphere that we uh, believe being the normal constitution uh, of our societies today, but that needed to be elaborated and the art world um, was, a, was one of those laboratories. So maybe it does not come as a surprise that the contemporary crisis in democracy has a lot to do or is strongly tied to the crisis in contemporary art. And I think this is where I should start uh, my talk. There's a lot that we could say about art and solidarity. In general, I think it's very understandable uh, that art has something to offer here because tuning into a perspective that is not at all your own perspective is something very frequent when you look at a work of art, when you go to an exhibition, when you go to a museum. Yeah? Uh, look through one other's eyes, look into the worlds that are absolutely not your worlds, but you actually start to understand them, are maybe fascinated, and they might become part 
uh, of your imaginary uh, that I think is per se uh, quite a contribution uh, um, to a democratic society. But even more profoundly, uh, I believe that art speaks to and partly constitutes what I call the social imaginary. So the ways how we look at ourselves and others and how large ultimately the group of people is to which we say we. Yeah? So art can contribute to a more fair and less cool society. But the truth is that this concept is over-idealistic and in crisis in itself. Because the truth is also that today the art world is extremely exclusive. It reduces the population to consumers of their culture that is mainly a culture of elites. And if you look about the public dimension of contemporary art, the largest amount of public investment into culture goes into the administration of heritage. There's a tiny percentage that goes into the production of our contemporary, let alone future, culture. On the other hand, the largest amount of money that goes into the production of contemporary, let alone future, culture is private money. And that private money, believe me, I'm also a gallerist, so I'm talking out of experience, is stolen money. It is fundamentally funded by economic and social inequality. And more than that, contemporary art increases today, helps increasing social and economic inequality. It contributes to the redistribution of wealth from the law, how do you From down to up. From down up. And it makes this inequality sustainable. This is what I think we could call neo-feudal conditions. And if that is true, the question will be, is there an anti-neo-feudal systemic change that we can imagine? A change in the way how democratic societies produce their cultures and therefore themselves. So I think that to critique these conditions is not enough. Most art worlders agree on that. There's a big hype around everything that is called participation, communal art, participatory art. Uh, in the United States, I learned uh, the term creative placemaking. Uh, that is very popular there, not so much here. It means the same thing, communities, neighborhoods, working together in art projects. All that, I believe, is not an answer to the question because it's basically a way to make citizens behave uh, within setups that were designed by a few people uh, in power. So... Here comes another idea. Go on, where can I get some comments? which is that many artworks of all genres are actually commissioned. Yeah? Um, and the history of commissions is very long. Basically, most of the cultural goods that we have, have in our built environments or in museum collections and archives or in our libraries to some extent were actually commissioned by someone. Yeah? And in democratic societies, we started 
to rearrange the way how commissions are made in a way that we believe it is representative. So we have experts, juries, sometimes neighborhood assemblies uh, uh, who can participate in the decision process um, in order to make the commissioning process a democratic one. Uh, truth is that, by feeling, 1% of the population have the privilege and the power to make the decisions in this process. And commissions are important also in the broad field of international contemporary art exhibitions that mainly shape the discourse today. Most biennials, all documenta, Skulpturprojekte Münster, so all the big events worldwide that we're talking about when we talk about contemporary art are based on new productions that are commissions. Yeah? So the myth of the autonomous artist who creates the work and then finds his public has never been true and is also not true today. Also not on a, on a literal systemic level of the means of productions. And what is interesting about this is that of course whoever can commission a work of art also expresses his or her interest. His or her privilege to make that decision eventually his or her uh, social ideologies, etc. So interesting, how can that be? That also in democratic societies in the 21st century, 99% of the population have absolutely no say in the commission of contemporary cultural production, comma, cultural common goods. And this problem was well understood by Francois Herz, a Belgian artist who lived in France since a long time already, who in 1990, 1990 came up with a proposal that could respond to the challenge. Quote, anyone who wishes, alone or in association with others, and the latter is highly encouraged, can call upon an artistic mediator to help them take responsibility for the commissioning of an artwork. So his very simple suggestion was, if we had in our societies people that he called mediators, they are curators, but they also have a kind of other practice attached to it, mediators who would listen to the people, who would pick up the demand of individuals or citizen groups and who would help them to phrase a commission to become clear about what a new production of art should address as a topic or what part of transformation it should, uh, it should offer to whatever situation, uh, then we could gap the bridge between the art world and uh, the general population. So, these are the new patrons as opposed to the old patrons that I had described previously. And there was one foundation in France, the Fondation de France, <coughs> who gave him a chance to experiment with that model and it became a grassroots movement. It started very informally with first mediators developing projects. This is the very first project uh, by mediator Xavier Duroux and it explains it quite well how it works. Xavier Duroux literally went for lunch in the University of Dijon and heard employees of the Mensa saying that they are unhappy about the fact that they are invisible. So they're cooking for all these people every day, they're trying to, to, to provide a good lunch situation but they are not valued in what they do. They're not even visible. And Xavier Diru understood, well, this is one of these typical situations that we have all the time, right? And it's something that I can actually do very easily, make people visi uh, visible. And he invited Yan Pai Ming, who is, was already a very renowned artist, uh, and certainly is today, and he quite simply painted the ten portraits of the stuff of the restaurant. Yeah? And hanging 
being like being hanged in that uh, in that restaurant, they actually represent a value that a university could never afford. You see, the production budget, 15,000 euros for 10 paintings, already at that time, is ridiculously small. Today, this is museum value. Yeah? I don't even know how many zeros you would have to add to that. <laughs> Something very important. In the new patrons program, we say, this is a real economy. It's not a symbolic or speculative economy of the art market. Artists get paid, and they can be, should be well paid for whatever they do, but the works that we produce have nothing to do with the market value. This is the project that everybody who knows the new patrons in French, Nouveau Commanditaire, in German, Neuer Auftraggeber, likes most. Because it's one of the strangest projects. You are in Burgundy, in the little village of Blessé, Burgundy at the time, in 1997, one of those shrinking rural areas with demographic and economic challenges. And uh, in this village, you have 13 families left, and they come together to renovate the wash house, the old wash house being one of the two social centers of the village, the church and the wash house. And they are so proud of their gesture that they call upon the mediator, again, Xavier de Roux, and say, we want a sculpture in front of our wash house like the cherry on the cake. Yeah? And he said, well, that's a strange idea, but they have taken an initiative, so I should better go and, and talk to them. Um, and he invited Remit Zauk to meet these farmers uh, and listen to them, because Remit Zauk himself comes from a small village, and the mediator thought he will be able to deal with these people. And Remit Zauk did something very interesting. And you have... Uh, what I want to show you with this is the moment of transformation that can happen in a project like that. Remitzauk wrote a letter to the villagers and said, your demand is outrageous. Who do you think I am to respond to that stupid commission? Already the renovation of the wash house is a bad idea, because nobody goes there. You have washing machines those days, like you're washing alone, yeah? And most of all, your village is fucked up. Like, how can you be so ignorant to only focus on one square meter while the buildings are falling apart, the streets are rotten, the nature looks bad? How ignorant can you possibly be? And he wrote, this absurdity, committed by you, in order to make this gesture a normality, again, the whole world around would have to change. Very beautiful idea. And of course, the villagers were very unhappy with that provocation, but they wrote him back. They said, you're actually right. Do you want to come back? And they decided to change the entire surrounding of the wash house, which basically means that they renovated the entire village, that they changed nature, that they changed the entire setup of their architectural, natural, and social uh, environment. Took them 10 years, took them 300 years of the yearly budget of that little village, so an economic dimension that is also outrageous for the community. And of course, as always, very important, it is not up to the citizens, commissioners, to pay the projects, right? We're not expecting anybody to bring the money when they commission a the work. So this money here, 266,000 euros, needs to be generated through fundraising. There's a very beautiful documentary that I encourage you to watch that tells the story of this project. Another one in Marseille, one of these typical situations. Um, you are in a clinic specialized on cancer diseases uh, where it is a frequent experience that people die. And it is a fre frequent experience of three nurses who work there 
that the families, uh, um, relatives and friends are literally sitting in the hallway waiting for someone to die or and being in mourn mourning or in worries and they said that's unbearable. And there is one little Catholic chapel in that hospital but that is like old and rotten plus Marseille is the most multi-confessional community in France. So these three nurses say we would need a spiritual place, this place of silence for everybody, for people from all religions, including atheists. Uh, but there's no money, the director is not interested in the proposal, etc. Uh, so they call upon the mediator of the New Patrons program with their request, and Silvia Ma suggests Michelangelo Pistoletto, a very significant Italian artist who suggests a multi-confessional room that has in the center one of his most famous artworks, which is an, uh, how would you say, an eternal cube. So it's six mirrors that are bound together to a cube, which means that inside you have perfect eternity <coughs> that from the outside is completely invisible. So it's a wonderful abstract spiritual object, you could say. And he brought together the representatives of the, uh, of the dif different religions. So the Jews, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the, uh, the Cat Catholics, and the philosophy professor were sitting together, <laughs> yeah, thinking how, how they can all equally be represented. Yeah? Which created also such momentum that the need for that space became more and more urgent and then more and more likely and again the money was brought together 240,000 space was found and the place was built. So three nurses have a problem, don't know what to do, an artist comes in, the situation starts to change and you actually get a very significant new piece of culture. Yeah? Um, and there's many more, but I think I have to, to speed up. This is a school that was built in uh, northern France. It's here. Pritzwald. I should quickly talk about that. Um, because it's around the corner. Uh, it's a small town in Brandenburg, and the mediator, Gerrit Gulke, um, went there, like on research trips basically, talking to people in the streets and asking like, what's, what's up here, what's the situation. Uh, and a woman told him, oh you know it's very sad, the, the inner part of the city uh, gets more and more empty, shops are closing, nobody's going there anymore, I wonder how this will continue, we need to do something. And that's a situation where <laughs> typically mediators go deeper into a conversation when someone says, we have to do something. Yeah? And they were discussing and developing together with more and more people. And uh, the idea at the end was to invite Clegg and Goodman to make a self-portrait of the city. And the artist suggested that the self-portrait of the city should be made by the citizens themselves. And if it is true that the citizens have given up on their city center and no interest, then the self-portrait of the city will be empty. If they want to have something else in that self-portrait, they have to get it done. And they wrote 6,600 letters to the people of town, inviting them to propose projects that they would like to do in seven empty shops, um, that were uh, um, classified the seven arts, like one space for music, one for theater, one for cinema, one for literature, uh, etc. And to their big surprise, 72 proposals were sent in. And during a kind of festival summer, I think six, 60 of those were produced from small to rather big, from not so surprising to extremely surprising proposals. And what happened then is that the citizens 
founded an art association. They wanted to keep one of the empty shops and make it their Kunstverein, which is what they did. And today this Kunstverein has over 70 members, makes exhibitions every six months, uh, six weeks, so it's a very active place. Uh, and a place like that had never existed in town. How far, how much do I have left? Go ahead, just tell us a little more. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, f a few years ago, I started to go to different African countries to, to meet people and uh, basically tell them about the new patrons project in order to find partners there who might be interested to set it up in the same way we're trying to set it up in Germany. Uh, and the first pilot project that is currently running is in Cameroon. The mediator is Germain Lupet, a very experienced anthropologist and archaeologue. Uh, and we went together to a pygmy community in the rainforest in southern Cameroon. And the situation was very interesting. So the pygmies are a very old, a very old nomadic people that since a few decades cannot live in a nomadic way anymore. They had to settle down. They're not allowed, basically, to live in the forests because it's protected, protected forest. Um, and they understand very clearly that their culture has to transform. And they make the experience that they are transformed by external forces and have hardly a possibility to decide on their own behalf what culture and people they want to be in the future. So their commission consisted of getting a capacity, a possibility to, to have a say in their own transformation and design it in a way that they want and that they can master. And the three elements is their polyphonic chants. They are world famous uh, for this chants. It's the knowledge of the forest, uh, and it is the objects that they make. So those, they describe that as the three most crucial elements of the cultural identity, and also of a, a, a possible economic independency. Yeah? Um, so they right now, this photo is one week old, they are right now building uh, for themselves a cultural center kind of museum also to, 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 to bring their objects into a new order. Yeah? And they will make a botanical garden in which the knowledge of the forest can settle down with them. Something very important. OK, so to resume what this is all about and why I'm talking about systemic change here. In this model, everything starts with the practice of mediators who are receptive to whatever is brought up towards them. And in the next step, citizens address them, constitute a group, and become patrons. And only later in the process, the artist comes in. The citizens are the souverain, the sovereign of the projects at any given moment. So they decide whether they like an artist or not, if they like the ideas of the artist, if they want to go further with the project. Yeah? They have total ownership of the project. It's very important, because most often it is not. Um, and this is something that you don't have in any other model, typically, at least in any other systemic model, that there's no decision on the artist, the form of the work, the location of the work, the budget of the work, the duration of the process. So if you want to apply for money, there's not anything that you can write into an application form. This is the structural challenge for us since 25 years. Yeah? 
That's why we're so happy to have the German Cultural Foundation who now gave us money specifically for the first part of the mediation process together with the citizens. Yeah? But when we come to the point where the artist has talked and worked with the community and has made a, a, a draft, a project proposal, then suddenly we know very precisely why this project actually exists. And the project has a very different social legitimacy. So in order to explain to someone why public money should be invested in an artistic production, here you have a whole chain of arguments why this should actually happen. You're not asking money for an artist's idea or a curator's idea. You're asking for the support of the demand of people who have found the ways how to express this demand. So later you have various kinds of supporters who then step into the project to finance the production of the work. And also very important, at any time in this pro process, a public can be created. So a lot of time there's already public debate about, uh, around a project even before an artist is invited maybe. At least before a work is produced. So the public debate around a process and a project uh, can influence the artistic production itself and eventually transform the project. Something very valuable. Um, and as you see, I said all genres, from architecture to internet projects to urban planning, painting, film, there is no precondition on what the media uh, could be. And in France, the program started in 92. Uh, in France alone, there are over 350 projects completed uh, today. And uh, what you see here on the right side is Burgundy. This is Dijon. And these are some smaller towns and villages around Dijon. And you see that the new patrons pro uh, program actually contributed massively to the cultural uh, production of that uh, region. And the mediator has become one of the most credible public personas in Burgundy, uh, known by so many people, because after 25 years, uh, this program has become very significant in contributing to public life. Outside of any museums, outside of any state organization, this is a, a, a grassroots grown program uh, uh, facilitated by independent mediators who are fully independent in all their decisions together with citizens who are fully independent in their decisions. This is why it's politically so important. Yeah? And this is uh, the same uh, happened in Marseille. This is only Marseille. So until today, 55 mediators have created over 500 projects in 18 countries. So their first steps of development in the United States, Cameroon, Nigeria, South Africa, India, And since this is about imagination here, <coughs> and we're allowed to, to, to touch on to the sublime, which means a change that we don't need yet to understand how to organize it. Uh, but if France, if, if a few mediators in France were capable of creating 350 projects in the course of 25 years, and today we have the possibility to also start a meaningful process in Germany, in Brandenburg, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, in Nordrhein-Westfalen, are the three Modellregionen, the regions where we will start. It is not at all absurd to imagine that 25 years later, and some countries later, you might have a large amount of projects. And that is my private utopia now. Yeah? That's, that's why I'm like fighting for the program. Because if I imagine specifically for Europe, also as a, as a European cultural politics, that is 100% decided by citizens and nobody else. This is a true vision, I would say, for a collaborative culture, 
where all the responsibilities are local, but everybody shares one and the same idea and commitment <coughs> to a certain type of organizing cultural production together. And yeah, that was my point.